Hello, I'm Steve Rosted. Uh, I'm talking about You Read Ahead, which is a dead project. Uh, geez, I'll play loud. But I'm resurrecting it from the dead. So, first of all, what is You Read Ahead? <clears throat> well, it's a system startup tool created by, by Canonical in 2009. This is like right after Ftrace was created. Ftrace was created in 2008. So, a year later, they used tracing to um, help boot up processing. It was done by Scott James Ramnet, who, by the way, now works for Google. FYI, I work for Google too. We don't work on the same team. So what's it do? First thing it does, when it boots up, it traces the open system call, basically. So when a file gets open, it traces it, records it. Then after the boot up's done, it reads the trace and calls MinCore. MinCore tells you where uh, memory in a file is um, present. So you can look at a file and say, this part of the file is present in memory, and this part of the file is present in memory. Everything else is not present in memory. So it records that. Then it records this information and creates a pack file. On the second boot, just as at the beginning of boot up, it will start reading this pack file and start calling the read ahead system call to tell the kernel, start pulling these parts of the file into the page cache. Why is this useful? Well, when an application execs, it doesn't get its memory. So what the kernel does, it sets up a virtual memory address. It basically reads the L file and says, OK, this part of the file um, will go into this memory. This part of the file will go into this memory. And it does all this funny stuff. But it actually doesn't pull the file from the disk into memory. It just kind of has this metadata that tells where the files are and where it's going to go. But it doesn't do it immediately. You can call mlock all, and it's useful. But as John, um, where is he? Ordinus is there. He mentioned at the RT, it doesn't always help everything, but it helps quite a lot. And when the process executes, it's basically a just-in-time situation where when it hits something, it pulls it in. The kernel will look it up from the VMA table and then read the memory in from the disk. And if it has to read in the memory from the disk, it's considered a major page fault because it's slow. But if it's already in the page cache, because sometimes the metadata is there, but it's not mapped to anything, but the, the memory, the disk information is actually in memory somewhere. And this is a minor page fault because all it does is have to fill in the page table and come right back. And that's usually very quick. Databases do the same thing. You have the same issue. If you have a database, you worry about the same problems. So this is a visualization of what I just said. So you have your application memory off there to the left. And say, right at startup, it loads, you know, this is where those functions will be. And you go to execute. Well, the first time you go to execute, guess what? There's no memory there. So when you go to actually, the CPU goes to execute, there's nothing there, it faults. It goes into the system, it goes into the kernel. The kernel will then look up the VMA table for the process and say, hey, this is the memory location in disk that this address sees. It will then pull it into memory, pull it into the page cache, and then now it fills in the page tables. So then it goes back to the user space, and it continues happily, executes until it gets to the next page and faults again. Wash, rinse, repeat. So to give you an idea of how this looks, I ran trace command, which is a front end tool, something I own. Go to trace-cmd.org if you want to know more information about it. And I did a tracing of the kernel tracing recording. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to record function graph tracer, which, tells, which traces both the start and the end of a function. I say dash L to say limit the tracing to only a single function, because that way, you know, function graph tracer has overhead, and I only care about one function right now. I want to look at the handle mn fault. That's the kernel system call, or the kernel function that handles when the user space faults and has to pull in stuff from the VMA tables. So that's the first function it calls. So I want to see, let's just trace that. I want to see how long that runs. I also found out from Matthew Wilcox, thank you very much, Matthew, that <clears throat> there's a system or there's a trace event in the, uh, the virtual file system layer called mm file map add to page cache. That's a very long name. I can never remember it. I always have to look it up. It's not something that comes to my mind. But what this trace event does is it gets triggered every time 
um, page, a disk gets pulled into memory into the page cache. And I want to know about those. Every time that it has to go to actually a hard drive or a device to pull into a page cache, this gets triggered. Very useful information. So then I recorded this and ex executed Chrome. I hope everyone knows what Chrome is. I work for Google, so hopefully I'm presenting this on Chrome, on a Chrome OS book, um, on a Chromebook. So I executed Chrome. I traced it. Trace command by default puts it into a uh, trace.dat file. So I moved it to say trace chrome start.dat. I could have just done dash O with the um, trace chrome start.dat, but if I did that, it made the line wrap, and I didn't want the first line to wrap, so I broke it up to do that. So I pulled up Chrome, shut it down, and I recorded it again. I just, so I did two records. You could do this if you want. You know, do trace command, make sure you start off, um, clear your page cache. I think it's like slash proc something. Drop, drop caches or something, or something, or echo one in there, and it, and it flushes the page cache, so nothing's in the page cache. So I did that first. Then I did Chrome, and then I just shut it, I let it boot up, shut it down. Recorded it, let it boot up, shut it down. That's, I did it twice. To give you an idea of what it looks like, I did trace command report, and on the trace.dat file, and this is the output, you'll notice there was first a minor fault, which means that there was, it took a fault, but the, the actual executable was in, mem was in the page cache. So all I had to do was basically update the page tables and then continue. And that only took 53 microseconds to do the fault. You'll notice down here, it triggered all the loading of, so something faulted and had to read a lot of disk space. Those are a lot of pages that are being pulled in. And that's a major fault. And if you look at that, that took 489 microseconds. Actually, rounds up to 490. How did I do this? So I wrote this during Thomas Gleichner's uh, ending talk at RT Mini Summit. So I wrote this code because I want to actually analyze this. So here's me kind of marketing libtrace command, which is part of you go to tracecommand.org. And this is how simple this is. In three slides, I got useful, basically useful information. This is the main. What I do is just say, OK, open up the file. That's you know trace command open will open up the trace.dat file. And it gives me a handler called handle. Now I'm going to follow two events. I care about the funk graph exit event. And I care about the, that long, really long name, mm file map add to page cache event. So every time the funk graph exit event gets hit, I wanted to call this funk graph exit function that you see there. So you'll see right there's a funk graph exit function. And then below that, every time the, that file map event gets hit, I'm going to call mm file map function. Pass in a data, my data here that I want to give it to. And then I do, I just call this iterate, uh, trace iterate events. This is how I use it. That's it. So now what this trace iterate events will do is it will iterate from the beginning of the trace.dat file and hit all the events as it goes down. And every time it hits one of these events, it's going to call that function you registered to. So the funk graph exit event, this is what it looks like. It gets the handler, the event, a record, the CPU, but I'm not going to talk about the CPU right now. Uh, that's another story. And the data. I'm going to get the TEP handler. TEP is the trace event parser handler. It's how do you, it, it's a way of parsing, or it helps you parse the binary data into a human readable format. Because I, I mean, having a blob of data from the event is kind of useless for me. I want to actually extract data from it. So in order to do that, I have a func field, because I want from the function graph tracer event, I want to get the name of the function. So to do that, I need the instruction pointer that's saved in the event. I also want the call time and the return time. So the exit event of the function graph tracer records a timestamp of when the function entered and a timestamp of when the function exit, which is, gives me the time of the function. So in the exit event, I have the start and end, which is nice. I, I, I've always debated about whether or not the function graph exit should uh, do that because there's a function graph enter. But I always thought, you know, for analysis, it's always been easier. So a long time ago, I made a decision to have the function graph exit record the enter event without having to have the function graph uh, enter function part. So then I, 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 these are static fields, because I only have to initialize them once. So the first time this callback gets called, it's going to initialize, so I know how to parse these from the raw data. 
And then here, this is how you read it. So uh, the TEP read number field, by the way, the TEP, anything that starts with TEP is part of the lib trace, uh, lib trace event library, which by the way, was pulled into perf early. So it got pulled in before I was able to vet the API. So the API is kind of horrible. <laughs> so I hate the API. It's got man pages. Go to that tracecommand.org. There's man pages for all this. Uh, all the functions are documented. So the first thing I do is I get the IP address, but that's not useful for me. I need an actual name. So then you can actually ask a tep find function, and you give it the IP address, the instruction pointer address of it, and it actually returns the name from KL Sims. So the same thing you would get from KL Sims, you get the name of it. Uh, from the, now I'm also going to read the call time field, because I want to know the timestamp of when the function entered. I also want to know the timestamp of when the function exit. And then here I check if the function name is called handle mmfault, just in case for some reason I'm tracing something else, which I wasn't. I didn't really need this, but I put it in there because I only care about the mmfault, so I there. Then I'm going to increment a counter of, hey, a, you know, a page fault happened, and I record the timestamp or time duration of that page fault. Very simple, one slide. The file map handler, so every time it pulled something in, I don't care about the events, so I didn't do anything. I just want a counter. I just want to see how many times a page got pulled from the disk into it. So it's just a counter. That's how simple that function is. Finally, I print it. So here's the data. I'm going to print out you know, the number of page faults that happened, the uh, uh, timestamp um, of, or the, the length of time of that, and the number of file maps. Since everything is in nanoseconds, uh, I don't really read nanoseconds well. It's too many numbers. Confuses my brain. So I created this print time function that just simply just converts you know, for the, the nanoseconds into a second dot u second. So I actually truncate it three, so I don't care about anything more. I don't care about you know, anything sub microsecond. By the way, I, I uploaded the code. I'm going to upload these slides to the website. I haven't done it yet, because I just finished the slides two minutes before the presentation. And um, <coughs> the, I'll be uploading this, but that's if you're, if you're interested in this code, it's simple. You can write it yourself, cut and paste. But this is, this is the output. So that little thing actually gives me information. That's actually very, very useful. The first time Chrome booted up, it took, I should have counted this, too many zeros, too many numbers, 100,000 page faults, OK? 1.98 seconds of page fault. So every time it went into that handle mm fault, it took a total of 1.98 seconds. The second time I ran it, it took 90 page faults, or 90,000 page faults, 0.7 seconds less than half the time. But still, that's over one second of boot up time was just in pulling in page tables. Shows you the impact of this. So what does UREHEAD do? Like I said, it records what is read. First boot, opens up all the files. Uh, after the trace, it reads what's memory, creates a pack file. Next boot, reads the pack file, calls the read ahead. Um, the problem with this too, uh, this is at least from Chrome OS, and I think Canonical used to do this, where when we started, we'd kick off the you read ahead. But of course, it's, re it's competing with the start. Uh, it's you know, on one CPU running, and there's another CPU that's running. So you know, if it takes a while to pull everything in, and it could be kind of useless because it's going to be pulling in stuff that's going to be pulling in by the application that's running along with it. So there is a little bit of race there but still has good results. Even with that race and even that thing, it's still actually much better than not running it. So the minor page fault. Let's see what minor page fault is. So, so you have real read ahead. It's going to call read ahead. And it's going to, so it reads the pack file and goes and looks at all the um, uh, pages that are you know, in the disk space and starts pulling it into the pa uh, page fault or, or it's a page cache while the applications are running. So when we take a fault, because we still only take the fault, because the page tables are still not loaded. It just basically sets up the metadata and goes and sets, you know, so when the application goes, it's going to fault still, so you'll still see the fault. But it doesn't have to go to disk. It's in memory. It says, hey, it's right here. Load that in. Much quicker. If you do a you read ahead dump, it shows you the output of the pack file. So if you're interested in seeing what was pulled in, it will show, it will give you a list. This is just one of thousands of listings, just one after another. But it's just packed, and I just grabbed one that fit nicely on a slide. Some of them are very, very large. Some of them are just one-liners. Um, but it, it gives you a little idea of uh, here's the file. Here's where it loaded stuff in. I have no idea what those at signs are, but something. Um, well, maybe it's the start of it. 
Oh, maybe there's a, yeah. Okay, it must be a, oh, I guess it's where, it, yeah, it must be where a pack instance is. I just realized what it is now, because they all start with that at sign. And down below, you'll see that it gives you the offsets of where in the file, the length of that, you know, that data, and also the physical address from the block. So why do I care? Well, I work at Google for Chromebooks. I'm actually on the perform uh, base OS performance team. I care about performance. I, I very much care about boot up times. And since this is you know, the embedded open source summit, embedded folks are here. From what I understand, embedded folks comp like really, really care for boot up times. And I think that's why this, this room's full. It was initially created, like I said, or, or, or by this, but ironically, Scott James Ramnett is not involved in this work at all. He's the creator of it, came over to Google, never actually uh, worked on it. So it's just, hey, here's a really talented developer, let's pull him over, but let's not let him work on the thing that we're using that he created. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I reached out to him once and said, hey, I'm gonna be reworking on this. And he said, I haven't touched that code in over 10 years, do whatever you want with it. That's what he actually told me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so Chrome OS uh, testing shows significant improvements with it. We have this tool called BootPerf. It's upstream, you can look for it. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the output file go to this uh, test board. So whenever I work on a Chrome OS, I work on several different Chromebooks, and my, my house has 10 Chromebooks laying all over the place, um, and I usually I just plug it. DUT stands for device under test. So I always use these uh, variables, board and device under test. The device under test is just basically the IP address of how to get to that Chromebook for me. But this is common from a lot of the Chromebook developers do this. So I have Chromebooks all over the place. I put this thing here. I say, okay, uh, whenever you see board DUT, that means it's going to access this. So boot perf is actually a command. This, I use this all the time and I just change the variables. And that's why I just go into my bash history to. Hit again, I don't have to modify that because I do search for boot perf, enter. And it runs, it basically will reboot the machine, run it 10 times, it'll boot it up 10 times and record you know, a bunch of information about um, how long the parts, um, <clears throat> how long the boot up took. So I went in and d to the DUT that I wanted and deleted the pack file knowing that's going to trigger you read ahead to recreate it on the first try. So I ran it, and this is, uh, I cared, the one thing I really cared about that I knew you read ahead helps with is the seconds between when the kernel hands off to user space to the login screen shows up. And 10 times, here, this is all in seconds, the first boot took 7.445 seconds. This is when the pack file did not exist. Every boot after that took six point something. A 14.5% savings. This is why we care about you read ahead. And it's, um, yeah. So, history of you read ahead. Again, created by Scott James Ramnett at Canonical. Again, he now works for Google. Um, it adds two trace events to the kernel to a get the open file system, because the open file system call, you can't look at the system call and try to get the file system because it may not be mapped. You have to actually find in the kernel where it actually maps it and then get the name from there. Of course, now, today, you might be able to use BPF, but I don't. These are the two trace events. Yes, I know there's three. <laughs> the, uh, but the last one is not used. It, they used it, it must have been used in 2009, but they never got rid of it. And there's a, now they, they added a check to say, if this isn't available, let's just ignore it. But this use lib trace event, I have no idea what it was, what it's used for, it's still in the code. So again, this information is used to find out where the file is open. Uh, one of the problems is it can't handle relative paths. So if you actually open a relative path, it just gives up and says, ignore it. So when this was pushed upstream to say, hey, you know, we want you to accept it. Al Vero says, I will not accept any, um, uh, trace events that are in my code. And this belonged to his code, and he knacked it. So that means to use you read ahead, you must modify your kernel to add these trace events. And then once again, after the fact, it used mincore. Um, what one problem with mincore and doing it this method is it doesn't give you 
any information about when this happened. All you do is you get the opens, but you don't know when in the boot up time that this happened. So it doesn't know if something happened right away or later in the future. So in 2011, you know, Scott James Ramnett left Canonical for Google. You re read ahead from Canonical's point of view, went into maintenance mode. Canonical is not a huge company compared to other companies. So when a main developer does something and leaves, usually no one else knows what that code did. So they're just like, okay, you know, it still works, so we'll maintain it until it doesn't work. <laughs> so this required forward porting those trace events to every single canonical kernel. So if you booted a canonical kernel, this would go and your boot would probably be, be faster than if you built your own custom kernel and did not include these trace points and then booted it, you read had to be dead. So no one actually took over maintainership. It is today unsupported by Canonical. Why? Most likely, I bet you they stopped port forward porting those patches. They probably said, what are these patches that we're forward porting for? Not having any idea why. I don't know, I'm just, my, I'm just speculating. I don't, I don't work for Canonical, I never ask the people that do this, but I'm just assuming that the Canonical folks are like, I don't know what these things are, they stopped supporting it. So, of course, Urihead stopped working. And, they saw, and no one knew why. I bet you they're like, why are we running this tool? It's not working, there's complaints, bug reports, my boot up slow down, I try to use, do Urihead, doesn't work. So, I guess they just thought it was broken and got rid of it. So, they said, no more. The last update to Urihead was 2017, from Canonical. You read ahead is dead, long live you read ahead. <clears throat> so, Chrome OS is now the last user. We actually understand it, we knew it, they actually been, before I even joined uh, Google, I've only been in Google uh, a little over like, about a year and a half now, and um, <clears throat> they've been, you know, we actually have quote unquote sort of maintainers, people actually looked at the code and said, oh, this is how it works, we're gonna maintain it, boom. No, Scott James Ramat does not help at all with us. But because, you know, the thing with Google is, and we know it, we have a lot more people, but these people are not maintaining you read ahead. They're maintaining other things. See, you read ahead broke and said, okay, we have to go fix it. So you'll see a patch, just a flyby patch saying, slap it to make it work and continue because I have other things I need to work on, other priorities, other deadlines and everything else. So you read ahead has been filling up with a bunch of band-aids. <clears throat> it breaks every so often. Get a kernel update, something happens, it breaks. We gotta go look at it. Very, very fra fragile. It needs a rewrite. This is where I come in, and this is where you come in. <laughs> so I started doing it. First thing I did, I looked at the code and said, wow, what a hack this is. But it was written in 2009. It's pretty impressive. You know, like I said, a year after tracing, uh, you know, tracing got into the kernel, they did this. And they really had, not much has changed since 2009. But I've gotten libraries now. I could rip out half the code because it did everything manually. I'm like, this is all, libtracefs does it, and if things change, libtracefs will change, and we'll fix it for you. You don't have to maintain how you access the tracing system. Libtracefs will do that for you. Rip it all out, put libtracefs in. Being a distro like Chrome OS is, this means I have to make now get libtracefs upstream. Oh my god, the bureaucracy of doing that was fun. <laughs> Pass were hard co coded all over the place. Hey, libtracefs will find where the tracefs file system is for you. It will uh, look at the prox file system, and if it's already mounted, it'll say you'll use it. If it's not, it will mount it for you. Does everything for you. You don't care. So, what about these two um, trace events that it, it uses? Got to get rid of them because our goal is to make you read ahead upstream, and we can't have it upstream if there's trace events that are not in upstream mainline kernel. Get rid of them. Right, like I said, it uses the um, open system call, but it doesn't even handle um, relative paths. There's got to be a better trace event. Anyone know? We were just using it. <laughs> that trace event with a name you can't say because it's too long. It can trace 
it traces the order of when things pull in. So now I actually could use this trace event and even know when in time in the boot up that this page went from disk up into um, the page cache. Doesn't even care about relative paths. So how did I do this? By using the MM file map add to page cache event, this is what the page event looks like. You'll notice inside the page event, it gives me the device major minor number, the inode number, and the offset into the file where, that, uh, where it's going to go. It also, by the way, I didn't put this in, like, highlight it, but it says the order. Right now, uh, order equals zero, which means it only pulls in one page at a time. But talking with Matthew Wilcox, who's the one that told me about this event, said that in the future with, you know, the, what's his uh, folio, <laughs> with his folio things that are working, it's going to have, it's going to actually be pulling an order of pages. So we get the order of pages that comes in too. So we get all this information. So we'll know all of when the, you know, disks being accessed, the devices are being accessed to go into the page cache. Very useful information. Then what I do is I look at uh, proc self mount info because this gives me a list, this gives me a mapping of that device to the, the uh, where it's mounted. So I found out the root file system, which is not the first slash, it's the second slash, um, is that you know 254.3, that's root file system. Because some places, if it's reading other file systems, I care about that. I want to know about those. Then I'm like, I looked at the, I looked, I loved open, I love open source. Because I downloaded the find system call or find, find application source code, and I was looking at what it does. Um, and it uses uh, get dn64 because you could get like all the, the inodes from a directory from like one system call. At least actually you get a block, you have to allocate and you have to say, give me this many, I'll give you this many. So it's actually really fast. So I could scan an entire you know, file system, finding all the inodes. And I keep track of which inodes I found. So what I do is I, get, I collect all the inodes from the trace and then I go through and once all the inodes are gone, I'm like, okay, stop, stop doing it. And this is like a split second. It could do this. It's pretty pretty fast. Actually, I could when you just do this, you're actually faster than find. So I did I did benchmarks. I'm like, okay, my little utility that scans the entire you know file system is actually faster than the actual find doing the same thing. If you want to look at by the way my development code, this is not upstream, but I do have a GitHub account that I do. I'm actually putting all the stuff. There's the main branch. If you go to my GitHub branch. Um, there's uh, where we have it, what we were using in Chrome as of today, which does not have these updates because I'm still working with getting the libtracefs and we have to verify, we have to make sure there's no regressions, you know, all the fun stuff that everyone here knows about. So, but I have a dev, a devel branch that has the code that this works. So I'm actually, I've been running tests and yes, actually it's still just as good as what it is today, but actually it's a little bit better. There's no regression so far. Sometimes it's better, it's more consistent. Because I noticed that the other one, the, the old way, wasn't always consistent in what, how it created its pack file. This one's a little bit more consistent. But there's much more to do. Because this is just a start. Only thing I did was I made it use an upstream trace of it. Now you read ahead from my devel branch can be used by anyone. You guys could go download it and it will work if you have a recent kernel that has that trace point. So it's upstream kernel. You read ahead to Vel, works upstream kernel. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to tell you folks what I've done. Now I'm looking for ideas on what more can we do about this. Now it's just kind of open up Pandora's box. We can now record like how things are done. I would like to create, let me say, I don't know, I better go through, I might be saying this. I want to split the utility to one doing the tracing and another utility reading the pack file. There's no reason that we need to have one utility to do both. You can then trace multiple types of different things, create multiple pack files. You know, so, yep, boom. So I want to make a series of pack files for a series of different situations. Well, for one thing, for Chrome OS, perfect. We would like to do, create the pack files in the lab that we don't even do the tracing and just install the pack files. Like every time you do an update, you get a pack file. But also we want to know like the first time you boot up Chrome, you're, it does a whole, goes through a whole path. You'll have to go in through and log in and you have to do your, um, uh, what's it called, you know, 
register your account and all that stuff, set up, you know, you, everyone's got the device, the first time you set up a device, which is not the path I want to be recording. Or actually, I can have a pack just for that. But then after you logged in, I can say, hey, now we're logged in. We're going to use a different pack file and start pulling things in. We can really fine tune this. So let's make it smarter. Let's start also looking at the timestamps and figure out where in the boot are we and where we should start you know, pulling stuff in. Maybe we could throw things out knowing that you know, we're not going to catch up to these. If we could now be smart enough to say, hey, we know how long this takes. Let's just drop these and start pulling these in. We can make you read ahead much smarter, much faster, and our boot better. So we know the timestamps. They said, can't skip things. I had to post this. <laughs> it's actually a serious consideration. If we're going to rewrite it, maybe do it in Rust. There's people that are doing Rust wrappers around the libtracefs, the libtrace command. There's actually one person actually rewriting my libtrace command in Rust. So everyone's going Rust. Why not? And if there's any other ideas you have, ping me. This, like I said, I, in my abstract when I uh, wrote to come here, I really said, I'm not really talking about what I've done. I want to come here to talk about what we, we can do. So that's, this is a call for arms, call for action. Let's see. You guys worry about, um, a lot of people here care about boot up times. A lot of people who care about things that boom, boom, boom. We have a utility that might be able to help us with this. Contribute. Thank you. I also want to say that that was 120 slides. <laughs> Told you, Chris, I'd finish it. We have, uh, uh, this is, uh, we guess we have virtual attendees. So uh, any questions? We have a microphone. Oh, there's a question up here. Uh, Wolf, Wolfram. Uh, Mike, 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 Mike. Uh, so, did you apply all? Um, no, you have access to timestamps and could do some basic sorting. Did you just apply some basic sorting, sorting, and did it uh, result give better results? I haven't done it yet. I just this is something. Okay, so I reason one one reason why I'm here and asking for help. I don't have time to do it myself. <laughs> I'm one of those Google engineers now that saw this and say, oh, well, I got maybe one day to work on this <laughs> and work on it, and now I go back to doing what I'm actually being paid to do. I mean, I am being paid to do this, too. This is just like, and there's, like, you know, try to get people in, and I'm, this is where I, I'm trying to come and make this a community event. If we do it where we do it, we, okay, if, if uh, Google does it, I mean, I'm going really going to be focusing on Google's work. I'm like, I figure out, get better ideas from other people. Other people have different things. I don't want to focus on just Chrome OS. I want this on everything. So, no, I haven't done that yet. I just got this working uh, a few months ago. Probably, actually, maybe in January. Actually, yeah, maybe in January I had all this working. But then I had to go work on scheduling and uh, S frames. And so I'm working on a bunch of other things that, no, I haven't done it. So the answer is no, I haven't done that yet. I'm saying it. It's a possibility, it's, it's a to-do thing. And ideally, one of the reasons why I'm here is hopefully one of you will do it and send me the patches. <laughs> sure. A <laughs> um, couple of use cases from Embedded um, that are interesting. One is um, often your, your root file system is a compressed root file system. It's a little bit of a disconnect between the block device, which may be a slow flash device, and then the CPU intensive decompression. So working at the file layer, you get kind of both pieces at once, but you can actually have some interesting, you know, optimally you want to keep that block device busy, but also if you're burning CPU while you do that decompressing, that may actually make your boot up slower. So it's kind of something a challenge with you to read had it. It's disconnected at the, from the block device, which may be slow, and then the compression side. I don't know if there's a way to connect those two things or trace both things so that you, you understand how that works. The other challenge is like the first time you boot up, running you right ahead, if your application can tolerate that extra slowness the first time around, you're okay. But for an embedded case, you may have that ROM file system. At build time, like something with build root, you want to be able to somehow do some kind of performance-based measurement and then build another root file system containing, you know, again, the, the performance information that you've recorded somehow. 
you know, that, that creates another problem with you read ahead trying to implement it. You can imagine you like a scenario where like, you know, you boot up time determines how fast your backup camera on your car shows up, very real example. The first time after a software update, if your backup camera takes a while to, to boot up, you know, for one, there may be a homologation requirement that, that you're violating, but it's also not a good, you know, user use case. Okay, so first I want to come back and say something here, that this is kind of like how people come to real time. They say, hey, I'm going to install the preempt RT patch. And guess what? My system's real time. No, it's not. It takes a lot more work. You have to know your system. So you read ahead is not a magic bullet. I don't expect it to be. I'm not marking it that way. I'm saying it's a tool that we could use. You brought up a lot of corner cases that maybe it's not appropriate. Maybe you could find a way like, hey, if you read ahead did it this way, it would work. It, one, thing that's, one thing I also want to show is with the tracing there I have, you can now have used tracing using libtrace command, run your traces, and then get the information to see if those scenarios are happening and how to circumvent it. So I'm just giving you like, the tools, but it, you have to do your homework. You have to understand it. Right, it was more a call to action to see if there's a way to solve some of these problems in general, yep. and maybe work the tooling into something like BuildRoot where you have the ability to do this. By the way, I will ask a question here to the audience. Is there some place like a uh, uh, group, IRC, mailing list, whatever, that's basically just on like boot up times? Maybe we should have something like that, have a boot group. <laughs> Whoops, there's a hand over there. Thanks. Uh, I'm assuming that the pack file contains the actual data, i.e. a copy of it from the disk um, with a SSD or some sort of um, device that's fast at seeking. Is there any point in doing that? And would it By the way, this was done on SSDs. That sure. Chrome thing was an SSD. So, I mean. What I, what I mean is, could the pack file just contain a list of the blocks to read? No, that's all it does. It do, no, oh, it, doesn't okay. contain, it doesn't contain what it, it's not containing content. It, that, that going back to the. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I just misunderstood yeah. that. That's okay. great. Thank you. Yeah, let me see. Wait, This happens when you have oops. This. This is all it holds. Offset length and physical block address. That's all it does. It's a file name. File name, offset length, boom. That's it says file name and all the um, offsets in it. Like that's the only information that you get. Other questions? Is there anything online, maybe? Do you know, or any questions online? I don't know if there's. I'll go check. <laughs> I like it when I have no questions. That means I explained everything perfectly, and everyone understands everything. Great. We're good. Wait, wait. Oh, good. One more. Oh, we have one more. One more question. <laughs> and for speeding up the whole boot process, you would uh, start you read ahead and early in the in the boot chain. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. That was easy. That's it. Oh, question over here. No. Dave. <laughs> Sitting down. Can you just group them all together? The space guy is launching right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's like, no, I don't want to talk to you now. <laughs> no, that's not the, uh, just a quick question. The pack file, is there a, a way to validate that it still matches your file system or file systems? Uh, you'd have to write a tool to do that. Right now, I think what all it does is, um, the way you read ahead today, I think, I think it's timed. I think it recreates the pack file like once every month or something, or, or every few days. It'll say, oh, let's try to recreate a new pack file uh, just to see if it's key, things changed. So it doesn't really, that's another actually something we're looking at is, is there a way to like detect that, you know, maybe the boot up changed. But usually boot up doesn't change. That's why we want to get a pack trial every time we have a new upgrade, because every the update will be different. So we want to make sure there's a pack file and kind of attach it with the applications. You could probably actually just uh, computer hash. It doesn't take too yeah. long well, to put it out in the pack file. Did yeah. you read what you expected to read? That's true. Um, another thing, by the way, I didn't bring it up because embedded folks, and well, I think I've heard it a few times in time, so, but VMs is another use case that we're looking at. 
because VMs, you want to quick up, bring up a really quick VM. You have this running maybe every so often, then when the VM goes, it has all this stuff, because that's, it does a lot of disk read to pull up a, a VM. Okay. Oh, is there, uh, are, we, are we out of time? We're out of time, I'm afraid. So uh, thank you all very much, and thank you, Steve. That was really great. Thank you, thank you very much.